Hello, my name is Candace Savage and it's my great pleasure to welcome you tonight to YXE Wildlife, a program about biodiversity monitoring in Saskatoon with Katie Harris and Dr. Ryan Brooke. This program is sponsored by Wild About Saskatoon. I'd like to start by acknowledging that we're on Treaty 6 territory and the homeland of the Métis Nation. And as Wild About Saskatoon, we often refer to a statement made by the Truth and Reconciliation Commission in their report, which reads as follows. Reconciliation between Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal Canadians from an Aboriginal perspective also requires reconciliation with the natural world. If human beings resolve problems between themselves, but continue to destroy the natural world, then reconciliation remains incomplete. This is a perspective, the report reads, that we as commissioners have repeatedly heard that reconciliation will never occur unless we are also reconciled with the earth. So it's in that profound context that we do our work as Wild About Saskatoon. We're very grateful to be on this land and to have teachers and friends who can help us to understand the wisdom that surrounds us, that is lives on, is embedded in Indigenous languages, cultures, and worldviews. So we're very grateful to be here in this place. We're grateful too to all our partners, including tonight the Saskatchewan Festival of Words, Amanda in the background here, um, who is providing technical support, and to all our partners. And I'd particularly tonight like to acknowledge the support of the City of Saskatoon, which has assisted Wild About Saskatoon with this and other work through environmental grants. And that brings us to our first speaker tonight, first of three speakers. Our first speaker will be Hilary Goff, a member of City Council, who is here to bring us greetings from the city. Hilary. Thanks, Candace, and uh, thanks for taking a moment to recognize where we're situated and how the work that Wild About Saskatoon is situated in the important work of reconciliation. And um, it's a real pleasure to be able to join you this evening. I've had the, the chance to catch a couple of the uh, speaker events that Wild About Saskatoon has put on in the last while. And I'm really thrilled to be able to join this evening to learn uh, from the researchers who you've gathered here uh, who are doing work in our city uh, to understand what it looks like, uh, what the reality of wildlife in our city looks like, and, and how um, understanding that is important for understanding how we um, continue in relationship in this city, uh, as, as you said, humans and, and the natural world, and in particular from the perspective of the city of Saskatoon in terms of urban development. And I want to thank you, Candace, and the volunteers with uh, Wild About Saskatoon and other groups such as the Nature Society, who've been working hard to help us as the city understand the delicate balance that we're in and uh, and that we need to strike when it comes to the future of our community and respecting um, the value of wildlife and the value of uh, balance with the natural world and how important it is to understand it fully in order to be able to protect uh, areas that need to be protected um, and uh, and to you know grow in a way that uh, that maintains a balance that's sustainable for all. So thank you for very much for all of your work and for inviting me to be here this evening. And I'm really thrilled to be able to learn alongside you and I'm eager to hear what colleagues from the university have to share. So on behalf of my colleagues on city council and Mayor Charlie Clark, uh, thank you for doing the work to put these events together and um, congratulations and thank you to the researchers as well and uh, looking forward to a great event. Thank you very much, Hillary, for those comments and from your leadership, for your leadership um, in the protection of natural areas. 
So we have two speakers to come. I'm going to um, introduce them in reverse order. Um, our first speaker is Dr. Ryan Brook. He tells me he is a farm boy who ended up with a PhD and is currently an associate professor at the University of Saskatchewan. He was born and raised on a farm east of Winnipeg and he still drives around with his left turn signal on at all times. So you can take the boy out of the farm, apparently. He works with Katie Harris on the Urban Wildlife Research Project in Saskatoon and does research on all manner of other projects from the jungles of Sri Lanka to the subarctic coastal lands along Hudson Bay. He is now in his 14th year of studying invasive wild pigs across Canada. I've seen him introduce himself as chairman of the boar. And he very recently won the Innovation Award from the National Invasive Species Council for this work. Before we hear from Ryan, we're going to hear from Katie. Katie Harris comes from her hometown of the Paw, Manitoba, although she's been living in Saskatoon since 2017. Academically, she holds a dual environmental science diploma and a Bachelor of Science in Agriculture degree and is presently working on her PhD at the U of S. She specializes, as you will soon see, in urban wildlife ecology and her research focus is on the impact of urban growth on wild mammals. She has always felt very passionate about environmental issues and her goal is to promote biodiversity conservation within urban landscapes. So before I hand this over to Katie, I'd like to say a special welcome to Katie's grandma, who I understand is joining us tonight from the PAW. Katie, it's all yours. Thank you so much. I'm going to share my screen now. Almost now. Perfect. So hello, everyone. Thank you so much for those introductions. And thank you, everyone, for joining us. So this is going to be about a 40 minute presentation. And I'm just going to start off by just setting the stage for our research and really giving like a big picture type overview of why this work matters. And then I will follow that by getting into some of the specifics of this research project and talking through some of the things that we've learned so far. So what is the issue? Well, urbanization, which is essentially the growth of cities, involves transforming our natural environments to fulfill human needs. So basically, there is this very large, very rapid, and essentially permanent change that is happening to our native environments, and it's caused by the horizontal growth of our cities or urban sprawl. To add to this, each year more and more people are moving away from rural areas and into cities. And then alongside this, the average global human population continues to increase on a yearly basis as well. So every year, Saskatoon is growing not only in just city area, but in human population and human density as well. And this is changing our landscape. And some of the consequences of this change are the impacts to all of the species who live on and rely on our natural landscapes. And these impacts can be good just as they can be bad. Now, cities are actually considered as an ecosystem. It's called the urban ecosystem. Uh, this, of course, is far different from the ecosystems that we usually hear about, like a woodland or a grassland. And so they're characterized by very different things. So for one, urban ecosystems tend to be organized along different types of gradients. So for example, my particular study looks at biodiversity across an urban to rural gradient. And that just means the change in the level of built features or urban features as you move into the city from the city edge. And this of course is not something that you would find in a wild ecosystem. Um, and I'll be getting into that a little bit more in a later slide. Uh, cities are also characterized by landscape fragmentation. So this means that there are many barriers to free wildlife movement and therefore also barriers to animal interactions as well. 
Um, because an urban ecosystem is chopped up into these little tiny habitat patches, there are really big reductions to the accessibility of urban resources. And most of the available wildlife habitat tends to come in these isolated patches of varying quality scattered throughout this built uh, urban or these built concrete features. Uh, and these habitats, they can range from heavily modified areas to highly naturalized areas. So um, this includes everything from backyards to golf courses, parks, cemeteries, the river valley, ditches, uh, etc. <clears throat> so let's talk about biodiversity. So just a general definition, biodiversity is essentially just the amount or the variety of species living in an area, and it is really super important for many reasons. So for starters, having high levels of biodiversity, so lots of different species of all shapes and sizes and all performing different but equally important roles in that ecosystem is what ensures that these areas like our rivers and our lakes and our forests are functioning in a healthy and sustainable way. And we humans, we rely on these ecosystems in almost every facet of our lives because so many things that we need and use and that enhance the quality of our lives all came at one point from the natural environment. And once we start making large scale changes to these environments by draining wetlands or clear cutting forests, et cetera, what happens is that biodiversity will decline and will begin to lose species until in extreme cases, that ecosystem just essentially becomes non-existent and it's just no longer able to function. And so the resources that these areas used to provide um, just become no longer available, like in this image here. And this relates to so much more than just physical goods like timber, for instance. Um, healthy ecosystems are also responsible for these essential global processes like climate regulation, soil health, clean air, clean water, like the list goes on and on. And so protecting and conserving biodiversity is really key for maintaining healthy and again, sustainable environments, as well as the goods and the services that they provide. Biodiversity is also really, really important for human well-being. Um, there have been so many scientific studies on how human beings react to areas that have different levels of biodiversity. And across the board, all facets of human well-being, mental, physical, emotional health, are all enhanced when interacting with areas that contain higher levels of biodiversity. And let's just think about this for a second. Both of these images here are both of parks uh, here in the city of Saskatoon. And just at first glance, you can maybe tell that there are some pretty obvious differences between them. Um, so on the left-hand side, we have one of our naturalized parks. And in this park, you can see all sorts of different trees and shrubs. There's tall grasses, short grass, there's a wetland. There's a bunch of different flowering plants here as well, just you know, in the springtime. And there's just, there's diversity, there's structure and complexity, different life forms, different heights, a variety of different food sources, and just variety in general. Whereas compared to the park on the right, there just isn't really any structure, you know, there's no diversity. Pretty much all you see as you look around is this mowed lawn, right? Like there's just not much there. And the point that I'm trying to illustrate here is how vegetation, how plants, are really the foundation of biodiversity. The greater diversity of plant life that you have in an area like the green space on the left, the more insects and birds and small mammals can be supported there, which in turn supports the next trophic level and so on. There is a diversity of life here, all performing different functions that all fit together like a big puzzle. Whereas in a monoculture system or an area that lacks environmental diversity and only has like one or two types of plant life forms like this park on the right, there's just not enough variety, not enough different types of food sources or enough shelter or things of that nature to attract the diversity of smaller critters that would then support the larger animals and so on. And in fact, really almost no wild species could be supported here other than, you know, invasives. And then we lose out on all of those ecological benefits that we would otherwise be receiving from that area. Like there's no pollinators, there's no flood control, you know, water just runs right off because there's nothing there to intercept it. And we lose out on all of those intrinsic benefits as well. Basically, 
areas that offer only a single type of resource are just really incredibly limiting. Whereas a biodiverse green space is incredibly beneficial, not only for overall sustainability, but also for human health. And again, this has been scientifically proven. And so protecting and enhancing biodiversity by ensuring that we have enough high quality and suitable urban habitat is really critical for conservation, as well as the maintenance of healthy ecosystems and healthy human lives as well. Unfortunately, biodiversity loss is one of the major consequences of landscape modification. Uh, this loss is occurring at an extremely rapid rate, and we are currently in a global biodiversity crisis, as every year more and more species become extinct. And this terrifying reality is depicted by this figure here on this slide, um, which came from the 2020 Living Planet Report, and it shows the global declines in biodiversity from 1970 to 2016. So over those uh, 46 years, which is you know not even a single human lifetime, we have lost an average of 68% of our global vertebrate species populations. And these numbers are just climbing every year. Add in the fact that human-caused landscape transformation is the primary cause of animal extinction in North America, and this all just really emphasizes the need for urban research and stronger just conservation practices in general, but far stronger urban conservation in specific. And we really need to understand how our cities can be used to effectively fulfill the habitat and resource needs of our wild species in order to make up for these losses that we are creating in our environments. Now, there are certain traits that will increase a species risk of extinction. And among a few other things, these include rarity or rare species, um, small population sizes, uh, species that have really small or isolated home ranges. So um, for instance, this includes species found in places like islands, um, also species with really specialized diets or slow reproduction or slow growth rates, and then species that have seasonal migrations. So any species that displays at least one of these traits, but definitely one or more, um, just faces a higher risk of extinction from human landscape modification. And so as you saw in the figure on the last slide, species extinctions and biodiversity losses are linked very closely with the changing and fragmenting of our landscape and therefore the issue of urban sprawl. So how are wild animals able to survive in our urban ecosystems? Uh, this all has to do with wildlife adaptations to urban areas. And these are the why and the how certain species are able to really quite happily live alongside us. Um, there are several features that allow an animal to be more successful in urban habitats. And I'm gonna go through each of them in more detail, but they all really relate to adaptability and in general are the ability to be flexible with uh, primary activity patterns, the ability to live within really small home ranges or small habitat patches, um, the ability to make use of subsidized food sources, which is really just a nice way of saying free human food sources like gardens. And lastly, and possibly most important, uh, is the ability to tolerate humans as well as associated human disturbances like sudden noises, light pollution, heavy vehicle traffic, that kind of stuff. So the first one I mentioned is this ability to have flexible activity patterns. Um, many, many, many animals live in cities and yet we rarely see them in our day-to-day -day lives. And this is because a lot of the animals that live in the city have out of necessity really um, shifted to behaving primarily nocturnally. And this is an adaptation for living in densely populated human settlements. So animals feel safest when their perceived threat level is lowest, which makes sense, right? And the threat level or risk level within cities tends to be lowest at night, which is when human activity is at its lowest point and uh, a human disturbances like noise and light are also at their most minimal level as well. And uh, actually most of my inner city photos, uh, like the ones on the slide here, all tend to occur once the sun has set. Uh, this, of course, is not true for all animals. 
um, a lot of the smaller prey type species especially uh, behave quite oppositely and actually tend to be most active during the day. And one of the big reasons for this is because humans, while usually perceived as a threat, um, can also be used as a shield. And this is typically as a method to reduce predation. And this is because a lot of these smaller animals have figured out that predators tend to not exist in the areas or like during the times of day um, where there is a high density of humans. So this is a really neat adaptation um, referred to as human shielding. And this is something that I will actually be investigating more um, through the course of my research. So the second one I mentioned is this ability to live within small home ranges. So let's take a, a quick overhead look at Saskatoon here. So this map is uh, the Miwasan Valley's Saskatoon connectivity map, and it illustrates all of the potential available habitats that we have here in the city, um, which are all of these colors listed here on the side, um, as well as the non-suitable urban habitat, which is all of that gray, and that pretty much just represents all of the built things like buildings or parking lots or roads, et cetera. And then those lighter green colors uh, show the areas that may possibly be used as a wildlife movement corridor. And those corridors are areas of land that may allow an animal to move between isolated habitat patches. And these corridors are absolutely critical for allowing wildlife to access uh, required resources on an extremely fragmented landscape like a city. And you'll notice here in this map that other than the egg lands kind of at the city periphery, um, any available habitat within the city is generally pretty small um, and also very much isolated from the other habitat patches. And this is in really great contrast to natural ecosystems, which unless we are disturbing the landscape, should generally be composed of much larger and connected habitats. So these really small habitat patches in a city mean that an animal's home range is far smaller than they would other, otherwise use. And um, this is one of the uh, main reasons why we do not see a lot of larger animals in cities. A, a lot of our larger species we have here, like moose or bears, are just really uh, not compatible with the urban landscape. Although um, this has been changing a little bit as we consume more of the landscape, and a lot of these animals are starting to kind of be forced into or around urban areas. And so these corridors are just really important because they let animals safely move into and out of the city as well as between these tiny areas of, of habitat. And actually, um, all of my very low diversity sites here in the city are in all of these areas on this map that are just not connected in any real way to anything else, all of these little parks and stuff. Um, also, I do want to point out here that we have this really awesome movement corridor um, that you can see along the river uh, within that riparian zone, and I do see a lot of animals using that to traverse the city. Uh, these are just a few examples of some of the corridors that we have here in Saskatoon. So they can include anything and everything from roadside ditches to walking trails to back alleys um, to just footpaths made by people walking through the snow. Um, so these corridors can come in this huge variety of shapes and sizes. Uh, some of them are obviously higher quality than others, but they're all necessary for preserving urban diversity and again, allowing animals to access um, these areas of habitat and the resources that we have in the city as well. So the third uh, point I mentioned was this ability to make use of subsidized food sources. So because certain species are unable to exist in cities, typically large predators, uh, the urban food chain does vary quite a bit from what we would see in wild type ecosystems. So what would have been the top or the apex predators, wolves, cougars, um, et cetera, they're just not tolerated by humans. And so even if those species, even if those animals, they do show up here or they do show up in cities, uh, which it does happen on occasion, they are almost immediately removed or removed as soon as someone sees them. And so the animals that we do tolerate in the city uh, tend to be lower on the food chain. And these types of animals generally uh, tend to be far more opportunistic. And what that means is that they will pretty much eat whatever is available when they have the opportunity to. Uh, also the predators that we do have here in the city like foxes and coyotes 
Uh, they're both omnivorous and opportunistic. So while they do and they will predate smaller animals, uh, they will also consume pretty much whatever else there is around them, uh, including any human created food sources, right? Compost, human waste, gardens, edible shrubs, apple trees, uh, things of that nature. And a lot of this, of course, really should not be consumed by animals, uh, specifically things like garbage. And I really always want to emphasize that we should not be feeding wild animals, any wild animal, um, as this can be really bad for their health. And unhealthy animals lead to far higher instances of aggression and conflict. And so it is really important to ensure that any possible food attractions, such as garbage bins, recycling bins, backyard compost bins, um, are always properly secured. And then the last point I wanna talk about is this ability to tolerate humans. And human tolerance is a trait that our urban jackrabbits exemplify. And so I'm gonna be using them as my main example here. Now, I don't know about anyone else here, uh, but there has been more than a few occasions where I'm able to walk, not even sneakily, but just normally walk up to a jackrabbit in the city and get to like a few feet away from them before they even bother to start moving away from me. And this is not something that happens in natural ecosystems where natural selection tends to remove the slow movers from the population um, and there has never been a single instance I can think of where I've been able to get within meters of a wild rabbit, you know, never mind feet. So we call this fear-based trait vigilance. And having a lower vigilance level in urban areas can allow animals to reduce stress and save energy by reducing any energetic losses that result from being frightened and having to run away. And this is because being constantly scared or stressed out by external stimuli of which there is a never ending supply of in cities is exhausting <laughs> and not necessarily as useful in urban habitats as in natural areas. And so some urban species have adapted in such a way that has dulled that sense, so to speak. And this allows them to have a much higher tolerance for humans and human activity. And so they can be highly active during the day and away from a lot of predators. Um, of course, this would be a huge detriment to survival in wild systems. Um, there is a really good reason why certain species evolved to have these heightened vigilance levels, um, but it is something really interesting that we're seeing in urban areas. All right, um, so now I'm going to get into some of the specifics of the Saskatoon Wildlife Monitoring Project. So this project began back in 2019 when Dr. Brooke um, had met with a group of conservation-minded individuals who were really wanting to initiate a large-scale wildlife study here in the city under the Urban Wildlife Information Network, or UN for short. So UN is this international effort to standardize urban wildlife research across cities and countries in order to understand the changing patterns in wildlife ecology. There are currently 56 North American partners associated with this network, and Saskatoon was the second Canadian city to join. And so the Saskatoon Urban Wildlife Information Network, AKA Saskatoon UN or YXE Wildlife for short, um, was established through a partnership between the University of Saskatchewan, the city of Saskatoon, the Miwasan Valley Authority, Wild About Saskatoon, the Saskatoon Forestry Farm, Wanuskewin Heritage Park, and the Saskatoon Nature Society. And I would also like to mention here that most of my um, wildlife monitoring cameras, as well as initial supplies, uh, were very generously donated by the Saskatoon Forestry Farm. And this really is a novel study within the city of Saskatoon. So nothing of this magnitude had ever been attempted before. And this project has been set up to be a long-term research program and so the primary purpose of the Saskatoon UN project is to monitor change and develop a really good and in-depth understanding of urban wildlife biodiversity and ecology in Saskatoon. And because this is the very first uh, study of its kind here, I'm also working on then building the wildlife data bank for the city, as well as creating the baseline of local wildlife occurrences that can then be used to look at trends and patterns over long periods of time, uh, which is really something very powerful for research. 
Um, and then to be a little bit more specific for my particular role in the study, which covered the initial project development, as well as will cover the first three years of actual wildlife monitoring. Um, I'm going to be determining exactly which species that we have here, how they're using the city and how diversity changes based on the varying levels of development that we have here. I'm also going to be identifying some of the ways that wildlife are changing in order to adapt to our urban habitats and then making some connections between how Saskatoon as a city was and is still being shaped by and developed by the people who live here and how that in turn is actually shaping our wildlife communities. Um, of course, most of this I'll be determining uh, over the next year or two once I'm finished with data collection at the end of this August. And I'm going to get a little bit more technical here. So I just wanted to give an overview of my study design just to provide a bit of an idea as to how these cameras, um, of which I have 30 of them total, are uh, laid out across the city. So when setting up this study, we started off by sectioning the city into these six different urban habitats that are listed uh, on the side over here. So there's built, aquatic, um, forested and shrubland, grassland, agricultural, and then green space. Once that was done, we placed our two transects, which are just those two lines. And then we randomly um, placed each of those 30 points, which then became my 30 camera sites along the transects. So I ended up with five cameras within each of those identified urban habitats. And I am looking at wildlife biodiversity in the city across a specific gradient. So I mentioned that earlier, and it's called the urban to rural gradient. And that basically just describes how the level of development in a city tends to decrease as you move from the city center towards the edges of the city. And typically what you would see is that the level of available wildlife habitat also tends to decrease then with proximity to the urban center, and then of course increase again when moving away from it. And so to understand how urban development um, in, in here in Saskatoon impacts wildlife diversity, each of my camera sites also has an urbanization category tied to it, and that's based on the level of development within that specified camera site, um, which is indicated by this built analysis over here. Um, and so this analysis just shows how 40% of my cameras, which was 12 of my cameras, ended up within urban zones. And then I have nine cameras within the peri-urban peri -urban or suburban zones, and then another nine cameras within um, rural zones. And then this map here just gives a clear visual of that gradient. And so you can see here how the urban sites, which are the yellow dots there, um, they tend to be concentrated more within the center of the city, and then they transition out into the peri-urban, which are those green, and then finally the rural sites or the red, uh, the reds as you move kind of closer and closer to the edge. And then, of course, again, we have the river that cuts through the center of the city as well, and that provides areas with uh, far more moderate amounts of natural features. Uh, which resulted in a few more greener sites in the middle of the city there that we very likely wouldn't have otherwise. And again, this project was built totally from the ground up um, as there was no existing infrastructure or data in place prior to uh, 2019 or 2020. So it took me about eight months of background work just to set up the study design and figure out camera locations and landowners and permits and get everything and all my supplies ready to go. Uh, my original plan had been to get my cameras out and running back in March of 2020. Um, of course, this ended up coinciding with the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, so I did end up being delayed by about seven months before I was able to enact my study design. Um, thankfully, I was able to get my cameras out and begin monitoring back in September of 2020. And so I've been doing continual year-round fieldwork uh, ever since. And I personally will be continuing to gather data until the end of this August. And so for my part of this project, I will have a full three years of wildlife data. However, as I mentioned earlier, this has been set up as a long-term collaborative research project. And so even though I will eventually be moving on to other things, um, this project will be maintained into the future. And these are what my camera sites look like. So I do try to, I try to keep them discreet, um, but that can be somewhat impossible in certain locations that have minimal cover. 
So I have each trail camera set up inside one of these metal security boxes and then secured with a cable lock and a tree strap to the mount, uh, which is typically a tree. And each camera also has multiple tags identifying them as being part of an academic research study at the University of Saskatchewan and includes our contact and permit info. Um, and actually we've only had like less than a handful of people calling to ask about them, which is far less than what we had been anticipating. Um, but the overall response to this project and to the cameras themselves has been largely positive. Uh, however, it's not been completely positive um, and I have had, uh, very unfortunately, multiple thefts as well as vandalism occurring, um, which is really unfortunate, but also I think just a part of doing urban research. And so the cameras are also all padlocked and a lot of them have been chained up as well. And I'll also mention here that I totally discard all of the photos I collect that have people in them. So I only keep the wildlife photos. And of those, I will only be using the mammal data in my analyses. So over the course of two years and five months, uh, so from September 2020 to February 2023, I collected a total of just over 38,000 images of wild mammal species in Saskatoon at only 30 locations. Uh, and in those images, I have identified 21 different mammal species living beside us here in the city, which is really cool. Um, so I have also seen quite a few interesting birds show up on my cameras as well. But again, my focus is on wild mammals. So 21 species currently, um, but of course, the longer that these cameras remain active, the greater the chances are of capturing footage of rare or endangered animals. So I'm just gonna quickly go over each of these now, starting with the North American beaver, um, who really only kind of shows up obviously along the riverbanks. And then this is the American badger. Um, this was my most recent new find. Um, this image was taken at the very end of last November and it was very exciting to catch one of them on camera. Uh, we do also have a few weasel species. So this is the long-tailed weasel and this is its close relative, um, the short-tailed weasel, also known as a stout. Uh, we have a few different squirrel species as well. So this is our tree squirrel called the red squirrel. And then we have three ground squirrels as well. So this is the very common Richardson's ground squirrel, uh, a 13 lined chipmunk, and then the third one, the least chipmunk. Uh, we do also have black bears, um, although I've only seen this one and it was outside the city proper um, within a rural area. <laughs> so no need to worry. Uh, we do, of course, have a few different mice around as well. Um, I see them sometimes on my cameras, although the camera angle usually isn't quite right to get good pictures of them. Um, all of my cameras being positioned at my chest height above the ground. Uh, next is one of our two deer species. So this is the mule deer. And then our other deer species, which is, of course, the white-tailed deer, um, which is, you can tell by that very nice white plume of a tail um, you can see on them. Uh, we also have coyotes here, um, although they do tend to stick more to the edges of the city. And then this is the white-tailed jackrabbit. So this is the rabbit that you see everywhere throughout the city. Um, and not to be confused with our other hare species. So this is the snowshoe hare, um, which is a lot smaller in size and are also far less common here than the white-tailed jackrabbits. We also have muskrats. Um, I usually see them hanging out in some of our city park ponds. And then the red fox. Uh, the red fox appears everywhere throughout the city. They're actually incredibly common. Uh, North American porcupine. Um, so these guys show up at a lot of my sites that are closer to the city edge or kind of at an uh, egg uh, woodland interface. Uh, we also have skunks here throughout the city as well. So this is the striped skunk. Uh, we have a few raccoons, so mostly I see them along the riverbanks or in um, little patches of woodland. And then last, but certainly not least, is the moose. So there has been some really interesting patterns occurring lately with our moose population in Saskatchewan um, in terms of range expansion and also just a noted increase in the number of moose sightings and especially moose sightings in the city. So I am actually currently working on something that is looking at how those, looking at those trends and how they're increasing. 
Uh, so it will be really interesting to see what comes of that. And so the ability of wild animals to actually live in or effectively use the city based on all of those adaptations that I talked about earlier, it tends to occur across a spectrum. So at one end of the spectrum are the species that just cannot live here. Um, and these are most of our very large species or predators. And then the other end of the spectrum are the species who are very much able to adapt to life in the city and uh, sometimes can even reach far higher populations in the city than they would in the wild. And the white-tailed jackrabbit, of course, is a great example of that. Uh, however, most of these species here on this slide and just most species in general tend to fall somewhere more in the middle of that spectrum. And of those 21 species that I just went through, there are four of them in particular that I see far more frequently than any of the others. So I'm just going to talk uh, through each of these now in just a little bit more detail. So coming in fourth place is the coyote. So this is one of our two wild canids, um, the other being the fox. And they are incredibly flexible and adaptable animals. And they do thrive in urban settings, um, but in general, healthy coyotes thrive by avoiding areas that are highly urban or have lots of people around. And so I see them by far the most at the city perimeter um, or in the areas that have really low human presence or low levels of disturbance. Uh, and they are considered the top predator in our urban ecosystem. And they are really important for food chain regulation as they help to keep the rabbits and other small animal populations under control. Third place goes to the mule deer. Um, so this species has adapted to our local urban environment far better than white-tailed deer, who I only see outside of the city proper. So our, um, our mule deer, on the other hand, they actually seem to be far more tolerant to human presence. And I see them in a lot of the peri-urban sites in the, like in the suburbs around the city. And uh, they also use the river corridor a lot as well to move in and out of the city and access the resources here. And I have also seen many young deer on my cameras. So this is just a few examples on this slide. I have many more pictures, but there really is this evidence that our urban populations are not only making use of our urban spaces for food resources, um, but they're actually living and reproducing here as well. And then second place goes to the red fox. Uh, across North America, red foxes have been adapting to life in the city really well. Um, and not just adapting, but actually seemingly thriving. And they do this through the ability to occupy some of the areas in the city that no other animals bigger than a rabbit want to live in. So they really are a very flexible species. And they're really interesting to study in the city because of this high tolerance to human disturbances. And they will actually den and mate right inside of our highly urban or developed areas. Um, so really cool to see around here. And then coming in first place to absolutely no one's surprise is the white-tailed jackrabbit. Um, so I see these everywhere in the city on every one of my cameras, except for one actually, um, but that one camera is in very close proximity to a fox den. So it does make sense why there wouldn't be rabbits hanging out there. Um, otherwise, they do really well in the city, as we all know, um, and they manage to quite happily occupy our highly built and developed city spaces and especially our residential areas. And now this map is just a little bit outdated now, but the pattern that it depicts still holds true. And what it shows is how diversity on the ground here in Saskatoon changes from site to site. Uh, so just for a little bit of context, the circles here are each of my camera sites and they're labeled according to a diversity index. And that's just a measurement of the level of diversity at that location. Um, also, each color here represents a different species that I've identified. And so in general, the more colors there are and the bigger that number is, um, the greater wildlife diversity that site contains. And so just by looking at this map, we can see that biodiversity is overall highest at the city perimeter and then lower in the city interior. And that roughly translates to biodiversity being highest in the more rural sites and then lowest at the urban sites. And now this might not be a huge surprise to anyone as it really is kind of just common sense, um, but it still is really important to document this and we need a baseline uh, or a starting point 
for making these long-term predictions and examining these trends over time. And then um, lastly here, I just want to point out that we do have some biodiversity hotspots here in the city as well, uh, specifically along the river corridor. And that just really highlights the importance of that conserved area as habitat and as a movement corridor to most of the species that we have here in the city. Uh, we do also have low spots for diversity as well, um, which are the sites on this map that are primarily like that dark blue or the blue and lime green. Mm. And these are my very urban sites and specifically the sites that are either completely isolated um, or undergoing active development. And so the only species that I tend to see in those locations are mostly just rabbits and then birds like, you know, magpies. So I hope that through the course of this presentation, you've begun to realize, if you hadn't known it already, um, that cities can be so important for wildlife and for biodiversity. Our urban habitats, from parks to boulevards to golf courses, cemeteries, ditches, pretty much any and all green spaces can be so powerful for conservation if they're managed and maintained appropriately. And while it is really important to note the context that we are in a city and cities do grow as societies grow and opportunities arise, and I will never argue the importance of this urban growth, but I will say that I found myself in an interesting position where I do have cameras in areas of the city that are being actively developed, and I'm beginning to witness the impacts of this development on wildlife over time and I watch as the vegetation gets removed and dens get destroyed and species are lost. And it's not really the jackrabbits that I think about in these situations, but the species who are sensitive to disturbance, who literally are unable to cope with these changes as we continue to consume the landscape around us. On the other hand though, I also have cameras in areas of the city that are being actively preserved or kept naturalized to some degree and I've witnessed those areas flourish with diversity. Our urban green spaces are really just so important on so many levels and having these spaces and especially spaces that are in some degree connected to each other is just integral to biodiversity conservation. And there are many ways that we can combine urban growth with sustainable development that promotes the coexistence of people and nature. And my cameras are all stuck in place, right? They can only see in one direction and only for a distance of about 80 feet. And so I wanna leave off with the thought of how small of an area my 30 cameras are actually capturing relative to the total area of the city. It has been really eye-opening just how much data and how many images I've been able to collect in that tiny area over such a small period of time the value of the data that we're collecting will only grow more significant over time, especially with more cameras and more monitoring sites. And that could be really powerful for not only biodiversity conservation strategies, but also local development projects, updating wildlife management practices, reducing public safety risks, minimizing human wildlife conflict, education, like the sky is really the limit with novel research such as this. And we want our city, we want Saskatoon to be a part of the solution to the biodiversity crisis, not contribute to it. And this project and others like it do have the potential for ensuring that cities continue to grow sustainably. And so I would like to take a brief second um, before passing it on to Ryan. Um, just to acknowledge and thank the University of Saskatchewan, the Urban Wildlife Information Network, and the Natural Sciences and Engineering Research Council of Canada, as well as all of my local partners for the continued and very much appreciated support of this project. So thank you to everyone. That's fantastic. Thanks, Katie. Uh, I don't have too much to add other than just uh, say ama it's amazing work. Um, I, I just want to comment that one point that you made that I think is worth noting is that Katie is already wrapping up her data collection in August. And so we've sort of started the thinking process around what's next? What does this look like uh, version 2.0? Uh, do we have the support to continue it over the long term? 
And if so, what might that look like? Is it, do we keep doing what we're doing? Um, I think Katie's point about how small of an area we cover is really, really important. And that, you know, we're getting some great data and lots of useful information, but what we're not covering is, uh, is also really, really important to think about. And, and so I think that that's where I think we're really keen to get feedback from any and all folks in the city and any groups and organizations is, you know, what, uh, what should we be doing next and how can we build on this and hopefully expand from it? I think we want to do more. You know, we always sort of joke around about uh, Chicago has something like 450 trail cameras uh, running on a regular basis uh, doing the UN project and they have uh, unbelievable data and can support so many of these questions that Katie raised. So I think that's a, uh, we may not get to 450, we may not want to have that much data, but I think there's definitely some gaps there we need to think about. And so really open to suggestions and comments, uh, not just today, <coughs> down the road about what's next. I also want to finally uh, mention the, just a, a little blurb about something that was mentioned in my introduction that I study invasive wild pigs and I just wanted to quickly show that you know they are in our neighborhood in a very big way and uh, not too far out of the uh, out of our range from showing up in the city and that's the two things I have been a little bit surprised we haven't seen yet are cougars and, and invasive wild pigs and um, is that map showing Candice can you see that? Not sure why it's not, uh, doesn't seem to be popping up. Katie, can you see it? I can see your arc map, yeah. Oh, okay. okay. So, oh yeah, it's showing up. So, you know, you can see the city of Saskatoon here in the satellite imagery, and you can see red dots of invasive wild pigs that have been spread, uh, identified not too far from the city. A couple of uh, sightings actually within the city, and especially if you look to the, the north uh, east huge concentrations of wild pigs. And indeed that area that's not much more than hundred kilometers away as the crow flies is the hotspot for wild pigs in all of Canada. So I, I would say uh, with high confidence that it's not so much a question of if, if we're gonna see wild pigs coming into Saskatoon, but when. So yet another thing to be thinking about and another role these cameras can play. Um, so that's all I wanted to say and, and just sort of add very little bit to what uh, Katie has uh, provided an amazing presentation. So thanks very much. I'll pass it back to you, Candice. Well, thank you, Ryan, um, for that uh, chilling, <laughs> chilling warning about our newest neighbors. Um, but I wanted to echo what you said, um, thanking you, Katie, for a fabulous presentation, so beautifully presented and such amazing work to think that you've done this all single-handedly, 38,000 38, photos. It's just amazing. I've been sitting here grinning my head off. It's mm -hmm. so interesting and important. So if we were all together in a room, you would be having a standing ovation right now. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, there is, I forgot to tell people to please put questions and comments in the chat, but I'm pleased that we're all so very good at this and you're all smarter than I am anyway. So um, we do have some, but I wanted to ask you one first, and that is not a, not a small question, but um, if, so here we are with this grotesque, these grotesque declines of species and we know that urban sprawl is a contributor. So what can we, do? we also have just come through this COVID pandemic. And so we have had, we have lived the proof that if animals aren't healthy, we can't be healthy either. So how do we make our cities? How do we optimize them instead of treating animals as pests and intruders? How do we make, how do we really make it possible for other species to live healthy lives in cities? What would we be doing in Saskatoon? Yeah, that's a great, a great question, Candice. And of course, has so many, so many different layers and so many pieces to it. There's a lot that we can do on a, on a personal level, 
Um, so things like I had mentioned, like making sure that we're not leaving garbage and compost out that are drawing animals into our residential areas away from the natural spaces, because that is what causes uh, these, these uh, high levels of conflict and then conservation officers have to get involved. And then we see um, unfortunate things like lethal measures being used against these wild animals who, who really are just being drawn in through these, these natural instincts of theirs and through no fault of their own in, in a lot of senses. And so there are things that we can do on a, on a private level in our backyards. So securing food attractants, securing potential shelter attractants, things as simple as picking up the crab apples off of your lawn, you know, and when they all fall down and we would really rather just leave them, but raking them up and, and putting them away appropriately is actually a big a big measure for, for uh, stopping animals from being drawn into our, our neighborhoods. And then of course this, this escalates up to, uh, you know, a government type of level. So making sure that we're doing these really important impact assessments prior to development to do survey, to understand what species we have there. And then that way we can plan preemptive measures um, to help minimize some of the impacts that we're having. Um, and we can understand what species are there so we know how to then restore different habitats or, or how to tailor these, these areas for the species that are already living there. And then of course, like on a municipal level, things like ensuring that you know, lights are turned off at nighttime or, or doing things like um, dark sky lighting or, or putting in uh, wildlife crossings over highways or, or buffer zones around wetlands or the swale or, or known lecks or, or those types of areas. So there, there is a whole lot that, that can be done and I'm happy if anyone wants to reach out to me at any point and we can have a further discussion about it. I could probably talk on and on forever. Um, but it, it, there is a lot that that can be done and a lot that we can that we're already doing, um, but a lot that we can do do better as well. So, yes, great question. Thank you. <laughs> Candace, I'd like to make one uh, comment. One thing you might want to, to introduce to the speaker series at some point is uh, to have someone talk from the town of Churchill. Uh, they have the world's largest land carnivore on the planet that wanders around their town and yeah. city and they've adapted to it and there hasn't been anybody killed by a bear and I can't even long before I ever started going up there. And so there are some great models of, of you know, massive adaptation and people, part of, you know, part of it is technology and, but a lot of it is just attitude, I think. Yeah, I know Paul Paquette, the wonderful Saskatchewan based wolf biologist believes that we can live with wolves moving around in in cities like ours. I want to go to the questions from um, people in attendance as, and a story. Um, Ashlyn Reimer tells us, she says, I go to work in the middle of the night and I feel pretty confident that I saw lynx this morning with prey in its mouth. So that's oh. pretty amazing. <laughs> and someone else has noticed, um, has been reminding us about um, Mike Degu's videos of beavers in Saskatoon, really wonderful. And also noting that there is some mink living in the city that they fairly often see. Um, Ashlyn um, has a question for you. And that is, is there any opportunity to incorporate citizen science into this work? Yes, absolutely. That is something that we have already had discussions about and it's probably going to be incorporated into the project as we move forward and as we see how this project is going to kind of grow as I kind of move sort of away from the bulk of the data stuff. Um, and at that point, especially citizen science can be really, really important. Um, we've spoken about using like Zooniverse, for instance, for help with um, tagging or identifying animals in the pictures that I have. So like I, all those 38,000 images, I have gone through every single one of those images personally, and I have identified every single animal in every single one of those photos. And you can imagine that it is a lot of work. Uh, it's a full-time job. It's more than a full-time job some weeks. Um, and so being able to incorporate uh, these really cool projects like Zooniverse um, is something that we've been discussing and is something that I think could be really powerful in the future. Um, again, especially as I kind of move away and, and we figure out how it's going to grow. So yes, <laughs> good question. Thank you. Well, we do have to ensure too that there, there can't be another Katie, but we're looking <laughs> forward to the, another person who will be excited by what you've been able to accomplish 
who will want to take this on. And it matters to a lot of us that somehow this is made possible. Um, we have a technical question. How did you decide the height of the cameras? <laughs> uh, that was just a standardized part of the um, UN, the Urban Wildlife Information Network. They provided us with these standardized methods for setting up these studies. It's, it's part of what allows us to share data between member cities really easily. And so a lot of the, the reasoning behind the study design and the methods that I went with, or they're just the standardized UN procedures. And so it is to have at chest height, and they're all at chest height. Um, of course, this does mean that I lose out on really small species like the mice a lot of times, um, or again, even really large species as well. But because I'm looking at all mammals, I need to have a standard height. And so kind of mid-range chest height is the, is the standard for that. <laughs> And someone else has been wondering about birds. Um, mm -hmm. Why did you decide to focus on mammals? Um, what birds have you seen? And yes. is there an opportunity for this study to reveal something about birds? Yes, absolutely. I have seen a lot of birds. Um, the reason why I personally am not analyzing them or incorporating them into my data set solely has to do with the volume of data that I would have. Again, I have 38,000 images just of mammals. You could double that, if not more, if you add the birds in. And I I'm, I just don't, I'm, a, I'm still a human being. I don't have the capacity to analyze and to deal with that bulk of data. Um, that doesn't mean that I'm getting rid of those images by any means. Um, they're stored with all of my images. They're stored in all of my hard drives. Um, and they will be a part of the Saskatoon new and data set for all time. Um, it will just be another human being at some point in the future, I'm sure, who will actually dig into that and focus on birds versus me focusing on mammals. Um, I have seen a lot of cool birds here, though. I see raptors a lot on my cameras. Um, so we have a lot of red-tailed hawks, Swainson hawks. I've, seen, I've gotten a couple of great shots of uh, great horned owls, actually, um, in the day, which has been really cool swooping in. Um, of course, 80 billion magpies, um, approximately the same number of crows or ravens. Uh, I've seen blue jays. I've seen a lot of, of little songbirds, all sorts of different warblers, all sorts of different sparrows, finches, um, woodpeckers. Actually, I just saw a pileated woodpecker a couple weeks ago. It was the first one I've seen who's flying right in front of my camera. That was really cool. Um, downy, hairy, uh, all sorts of different birds, yeah. Um, and I have some cool shots too. Yeah, if anyone wants to see any pictures of them, please reach out and I would be happy to share. Because, Yeah, it is unfortunate that they can't be included in my big data set, but I wish they could, but I can't do it all, unfortunately. Where did you see the badger? That's a species of risk. That's fantastic. Yes, um, they are on the Species at, uh, at Risk Act. Uh, at least concern, I believe, but they are on there and they are important. Um, that was the northeast side of the city, um, kind of by Highway 5, near the old uh, drive-in movie theater, kind of that that section over there. Um, it was in the daytime, which was cool, and he, it looked like he had kind of been wandering in from the, uh, that egg land um, that is right at the, at the city uh, interface there. So yeah, that was really cool. And that's just another instance of, like, it took me, what, two years? two years to get that badger on my camera so and like they're not you know one of the most rare species that we have in the province here and so the longer that these cameras are out and the more cameras that we can get going the like the more species that we'll be able to find and, and be able to collect that data on um, which is so important mm -hmm. i have a friend muhammad zain al abedin who um the very first time he went to the northeast swale saw a female badger carrying her babies across the road. <laughs> Never seen one again, of course, but <laughs> they're there, they're amongst us. <laughs> Ryan, I, I know you have been involved in some ways with the, um, the with various committees of UN, and I'm, I'm wondering what value you have found in those associations and, and possibly if you um, encountered people from cities that are doing a really good job of integrating concern for wildlife into their urban planning. 
The UN model is amazing. It's been so great. They, they're, they're, you know, reasonably well funded. I think one thing they do really well is they have a dedicated hired person to keep this all going, which is critical. We have monthly meetings and they set up a, a Google sheet and you put in your, any updates, you say where you're at, uh, provide information because we can't have now with so many member cities, we can't simply go around the horn anymore and everybody uh, share, but I'm on the science committee. I chair the education committee and I'm on the overall UN uh, group that meets on a monthly basis. So we get together a lot and talk a lot about sharing data, which is of course, one of the big things is so we, uh, what happens is people submit proposals and they say, I'm really interested in wildlife showing up on golf courses, who has data like that? And then, people, you know, 20 cities say, yeah, we've got that. Or, um, you know, there was some interest uh, recently. It was funny because somebody asked us for data on what was it, Katie Badgers and something else. And I said, well, we have that, uh, was it boxes or I can't remember what it was, but we said, yeah, we got lots of that, but there's, we, we see no badgers in the city. And then we must've jinxed ourselves because then sure enough, we had a, ba a badger, but yeah, lots of really good collaboration, sharing ideas, share. And because this all goes into this big UN data set, you submit your proposal and then very quickly within days, you get a yes or a no. And once you're approved, then you have access to that database to pull out those um, whatever it is. And so, you know, we've been looking at moose. And so I was asking around, you know, what cities are showing moose? Of course, Edmonton uh, is probably the most uh, closely aligned in terms of they do have some coming in and just lots of great ideas. And we follow this standardized design. So to the best degree possible, we really are comparing apples to apples between cities and not just having haphazard studies where you're trying to say, well, there are differences, but how much is that design and how much of that is just differences in city and latitude. So incredible resource. Uh, I'm really keen to be part of it over the long term. Fantastic. Wild about Saskatoon, we're a little proud to have brought the idea to Saskatoon. So I'm glad it's glad to hear how, how productive and exciting it is. Um, I don't see more questions or comments in the chat and i'm really reluctant to bring this to a close but because i've enjoyed it so much but i think maybe that's that's us for tonight there's a wonderful presentation katie thank you and ryan it's been really really um good to have you here and to bring your expertise and and this other involvement with you and to us all um, I wanted to make sure everyone knows that on April 19th, we'll be having another program in this series. Um, we have um, Benjamin Vogt, I think that's how you say his name, V-O-G-T, Benjamin Vogt, who is the author of two books, um, A New Garden Ethic and Prairie Up. Um, Prairie Up is a guide to prairie-inspired garden design. And that is exactly what he will be speaking about that evening. Another way of enhancing our um, urban landscape for wildlife on a slightly smaller scale. We're talking about itty bitty bees and um, creatures like that. So thank you all. Thank you to Hilary Goff for being here. Thank you to Amanda for keeping us all working, everything working smoothly. Um, thank you all very much for joining us and good night. Thank you.